Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning everyone and welcome to this online workshop from Finland. So greetings from the country of thousands of lakes. Uh, apparently we had some big technical difficulties in, in France, in Marseille at YUCN, but hopefully they are all now sorted out and we can, we can finally start. Thank you for your patience. So welcome to discuss and learn about biodiversity, health and well-being and nature-based solutions. During the hopefully 90 minutes or so, we shall take a close look at some of the most exciting practical nature-based solutions in promoting well-being. We shall highlight uh, best practices from Finland and Scotland and we'll talk about the importance and the positive impact of biodiversity in different environments, including urban ones. This workshop is organized in cooperation by Metsähallitus, Parks and Wildlife Finland, the Ministry of the Environment of Finland and the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. My name is Jussi Pekka Rantanen and it's my great pleasure to be the moderator of this workshop or maybe I should rather call myself a tour guide since we're going to take you on a little tour, uh, on a little journey on a green continuum. In other words, this workshop is kind of a green virtual expedition, starting from protected areas, then moving on to urban spaces, and finally to even more built environment. And in each segment we shall find out about physical, mental and social benefits of biodiversity and how we can enjoy those benefits with nature-based solutions. And you can also give us your comments in the chat box, so I, I strongly encourage you to make the most out of that opportunity as well. Uh, now you may wonder if there's any, any real uh, biodiversity in, say, built environment, extremely built environments, but I can assure you that we have some pretty ex interesting examples coming your way. It's, it's great to have you with us, and once again, thank you very much for joining us, and we wish you all most warmly welcome. Now it's time to get started. First, for the uh, official welcoming words, I'm very happy to give you Finland's Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, Ms. Krista Mikkonen. Dear EUCN friends, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining this session, and it's my great pleasure to make some opening remarks as the state member to EUCN for Finland. The knowledge of the benefits of nature and outdoor rec recreation for human health and well-being has increased tremendously over the last few years. Evidence shows that nature has a highly positive impact on our physical, mental and social well-being. Nature and outdoor activities are an essential part of people's everyday life, especially during the COVID pandemic this has been even more evident. Nature is and has been an important reservoir for the Finns' social, physical and mental well-being. Rich biodiversity and people's active relationship with nature is crucial and the results we have seen are promising. In Finland, the popularity of outdoor recreation has increased over the recent years, and the COVID-19 pandemic has had an accelerating effect on this positive trend. During the pandemic, the popular nature locations have become even more visited, and in addition, people have found their way increasingly to nearby nature. Year 2020 was a record year. For instance, visits to Finnish national parks increased 23% compared to the previous year. From visitor surveys, we know that well-being and health benefits of nature-based activities are very important for visitors. This is highlighted especially in time of the pandemic, as outdoor recreation offers a safe and reviving environment for activities during lockdown. Dear friends, the Finnish aim and goal is to inspire people to move and stay in the natural environment more often and for longer periods. Outdoor recreation acti activates people and promotes their health regardless of their age and condition. 
Currently, Finland is preparing a national strategy for outdoor recreation in nature to support these goals. Protected areas and other nature areas and broader networks are an essential part of green continuum offered by municipalities and cities. They create a well-functioning, continuous green space serving the outdoor recreation requirements for local residents and tourists. We need partnerships across sectors, both nationally and internationally, to increase the value of our protected areas. This means also involving youth, children and all relevant stakeholders. Involving children and youth is particularly important because evidence shows that nature connectedness should be constructed at an early age, especially before seven years of age. Dear friends, here I also want to mention that education is crucial for raising awareness and generating action to protect the health of our planet and to ensure well-being. In light of the major environmental challenges the world is facing, education is key as a means of making our societies and economies greener, more sustainable and to reach the transformative change needed. Dear friends, I would like to underline the importance of continuing cross-sectoral cooperation between nature, health, business sectors and a whole of society approach. Together we can share good practices for nature-based solutions and improve human health and well-being. Healthy Parks, Healthy People movement has been growing already over a decade. It has proven to be powerful in connecting various actors in protected areas and sharing best practices around this theme globally. I encourage all the professionals attending this EUC and World Congress in Marseille to be supportive in creating best practices that combine biodiversity and human well-being into inspiring nature-based solutions. The Education for Conservation Strategy, developed by EUCN's Communication and Education Commission and other partners, including Finnish exper experts, and endorsed by, for example, UNESCO and others, is a way fo forward to connect youth for green and future agenda. Nature is good for us. Let's enable everybody to enjoy the great outdoors, whether in the nearby natural environment or a national park. Thank you. Minister Mikkonen, thank you very much for these opening words and thank you for highlighting the fact that during this COVID pandemic we have learned to appreciate nature and outdoor activities in a totally new way. Now I've been told that we have uh, slight difficulties with, with the chat, so the chat might not be working, but uh, let's uh, le not let that bother us and let's continue. Uh, now in the beginning I mentioned that this session is structured as a journey. So we'll start from protected areas, then we'll move on to urban spaces, urban green spaces, then, and finally we'll end up in built environment. Now oftentimes in the past we may have looked at these areas separately and concentrated on only one of them at a time, say protected areas or wildlife protection for instance. But uh, today we would like to encourage you to think of this green continuum as a whole, to embrace the idea that nature and biodiversity can and should be a crucial part of every environment. It's important everywhere, every step of this journey is important, is crucial if we want to achieve lasting results and great nature-based solutions. Okay, so first let's start with protected areas. This is where biodiversity is at its richest and where the numerous benefits of nature are at their peak. And no wonder nature uh, can offer us such an immense, diverse uh, source of, of different benefits. Uh, forests, lakes, rivers, the sea, hiking trails, camping sites, campfire sites, you name it. They all can promote our well-being in so many ways. Physical activity increases outdoors, it helps us reduce our stress, it helps us improve our mood and so on and so forth. And this is all scientifically proven. Now here's a little reminder of the many ways 
nature can revive us. Well, that was quite a list of benefits for our health and well-being and that's exactly why Parks and Wildlife Finland, one of the organizers of this event, strives to encourage people to move and stay in a natural environment more often and for longer periods. One of the ways to achieve this goal is the health promotion program Healthy Parks, Healthy People Finland. And our next speaker coordinates this program and now uh, she will tell us a bit about the role of protected areas in our green continuum and well-being and she will also touch on the different benefits and how they are measured and communicated. Our guest works on monitoring and management of sustainable outdoor recreation and tourism in state-owned protected areas and she is specially interested in visitor monitoring methodology. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome Senior Advisor at Parks and Wildlife Finland, Ms. Lisa Kajala. Thank you. Good morning everybody from sunny Finland. In this presentation I will focus on the wilder side of the green continuum, presenting the case of protected areas in Finland as a nature-based solution for human health and well-being. Parks and Wildlife Finland manages our most pristine nature and cultural heritage, including 40 national parks of Finland. Altogether, these state-owned pro protected areas cover about 18% of Finland's surface area. Typically, protected areas are uh, located in more remote areas, but nowadays we have increasingly protected areas also in urban settings. In addition to nature conservation, we provide recreational services for visitors. For example, we maintain about 5,000 kilometers of trails and 1,400 campfire sites. Parks and Wildlife Finland has been doing systematic visit accounting for 20 years now. When looking at the past decade, we see that the National Park Network has grown. However, the growth trend in park visitation has been much stronger than what these enlargements in the park network alone would suggest. And year 2020 we saw an exceptional increase of 23% in the visits to Finnish national parks as the pandemic further strengthened the trend of increasing park visits. The black line there. And for the current year we already know that domestic visitation to protected areas continues at a high level across the country. Outdoor recreation clearly, clearly has provided a safe and reviving environment for people when many other activities have been in lockdown. In addition to visit accounting, Parks and Wildlife Finland has been conducting visitor surveys in national parks and other protected and recreational areas for 20 years on a regular basis. Similarly to the counting methodology, the on-site survey methodology has been developed together with researchers of the Natural Resources Institute Finland. 
From these studies, we know that the most important motives to visit national parks have been nature experiences and scenery. Other top five motives are relaxation, getting away from noise and pollution, and mental well-being. From visitor surveys, we also know that 87% of visitors to protected areas felt that the visit had a fairly or very high positive impact on their health and well-being. In this workshop, we'll hear more about the research evidence on the mechanisms and impacts of nature on human well-being, especially in urban nature, in the presentation of Professor Lisa Tyrvainen from Natural Resources Institute, Finland. As our Minister of Environment and Climate Change mentioned, the global movement called Healthy Parks, Healthy People has been growing already over a decade. It is built on the idea that protected areas provide benefits to both people and nature, and at its best it, this creates a win-win situation, where well-managed bio biodiversity-rich protected areas support the well-being of people in a variety of ways, from recreation and tourism to many other ecosystem services. Moreover, when people visit biodiversity-rich protected areas, they become more connected to nature, thus understanding the value of nature conservation and becoming more likely to support it. I warmly recommend you to participate the other session today, at, starting at 8 p.m. Central European time, on this theme, arranged by this international community. It is called Nature is Good Medicine. International cooperation is important part part of Parks and Wildlife Finland's development work and the global and European contexts provide an essential framework for us when we implement our own Healthy Parks, Healthy People Finland program, which we have had in effect for some 10 years now. The aim of the program is to inspire people to get out and exercise in the natural environment more often and for longer periods of time. The program is built around three themes. The first theme of the program is from nearby nature to national parks. In order to maintain and build a good relationship with nature and strong nature connectedness, we need both easily accessible nearby nature as well as attractive biodiversity rich nature areas that provide an escape from the grind of daily life. Second theme is targeted at equal access and equal opportunities to enjoy the great outdoors. We aim at lowering the threshold for outdoor recreation, making it an easy and fun activity for everybody, regardless of, for instance, age or disabilities. In this workshop, the presentation by Peter Rockcliffe from Scotland will provide an excellent practical example on this theme. Uh, finally, the third theme is uh, of our Healthy Park, Healthy People Finland program emphasizes the importance of communication and cooperation. The results of visitor monitoring showcase the importance of protected areas on human health and well-being. These results are essential when communicating the importance of protected areas to decision makers. We also communicate the benefits of nature to the general public in order to encourage them to find their own way of enjoying nature whichever mot motivates them the most. For instance, in our nationalparks.webfi webpage, we showcase the various benefits and opportunities that protected areas provide to people. Projects have proven to be an efficient way of bringing diverse actors together, creating successful nature-based solutions. One recent success story uh, from Project uh, World and about cooperation between sectors is provided in this workshop by Terho Pekkala and the case of Central Hospital of Kainu. In the end, our work is all about improving people's possibilities to obtain mental, physical and social benefits on a green continuum, all the way from protected areas and urban parks to built environments and even hospitals. Thank you. Lisa, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. And since Lisa mentioned cooperation as one key ingredient in developing and, and promoting nature-based solutions, let's take a look at one very interesting example of that, a business example from Lapland in northern Finland. Uh, we all love trees, don't we? 
But next we'll meet a lady who has turned that love into business. But, and not just any kind of business, but something that connects nature and people in a very unique way. Like tree hugging world championships. The company is called Halipu, the tree hugging or hugging tree company. And it's a partner of Pallas Yllästunturi National Park in the far north. And we asked the founder of the company uh, to explain what it is all about and how she ended up starting such a business. So without any further ado, here is a video greeting from Chief Tree Hugging Officer of Halipu, Ms. Riitta Raekallio Vynderink. Hello everybody. Welcome to our hugging tree forest here in Levi, Finnish Lapland. My name is Riitta Raekallio Vynderink. I am the CEO and Chief tree hugging. Hello, officer. everybody. Here at Halipu. Welcome. Halipu means literally in Finnish a tree to hug because that's what we are all about. This, what you see here around me, this is an old production forest that my dad, an old lumberjack, grew up with. A few years ago, he told me that it was actually time to take the forest down. And then he was wondering what on earth he's going to do because he didn't want to do that. It was too dear to him. In the same sentence, he actually said, what if we adopt these trees as hugging trees to people of the world? I thought, yes, that's completely crazy. That's wonderful. And I took it and I thought, I'm going to make this into a business. I started developing it and that's how Halipo was born. Then we started doing live broadcasts from here, from the forest. Our record is 150,000. We we actually reached that on a during an episode on a International Day of the Forest, I think it was. Then we made an app. It's called Forest in Your Pocket. That the idea of that is to give people a little glimpses into how, for instance, the tree bark feels against your cheek or or the snow when it crunches between your fingers. And now it ha also the app houses our uh, world map of trees, which we started building last year. It's all about playfulness for us. It's passivities rather than activities. What we want to do is act su sustainable and with respect both to our guests, to ourselves, to our dear trees, our surroundings, our suppliers, we want to create a win-win situation for everybody that is involved with what we do. And we want to show that you don't have to take down a tree to create a business. We take out the physical product of, out of the equation so that what is left and what we, what we give to people is the emotion, the experience, the feeling. That's what conventional products are about anyways, aren't they? We're a tiny little company. We've tiny means and basically whatever we get we put back <laughs> back into Halipu. If we had bigger finance financial shoulders we would be able to do much more. On the other hand I'm really proud of what we've done just with simply with hard work. It's incredible to see how people respond to our forest, how they really immerse themselves into the experiences that we share with them. That's also why I'm so happy about the visibility that we've gained. We've had CNN here in our forest and we've been written about in Business Insider. And last Christmas we <laughs> even had Gordon Ramsay here. He loved the chai latte that my husband made him. The, the point here is not that we get our faces in the paper, that it means that people resonate with what we do they find what we do worth writing about. And that's incredible. There's such a need for nature right now. And that's what I love. Like the tree hugging world championships that we started last year. And we just ran them a few days ago again. This year National Geographic Russia wrote about it. And I think as a consequence, we got incredibly beautiful tree hugging pictures from around the world messages, stories about people and their love for trees. They were thanking us for giving a platform to share that love with other people. That just blows my mind. In the future, I think we would like to work with bigger organizations that can give us the space 
to do what we do the best, to bring that love for forests to people and to bring that platform to share that love to people. And I think that my secret wish would be to bring Halipool forests into city parks, maybe, around the world. So if you have great propos propositions to us, then, then bring them our way. Let us hear that. Until then, see you in our forest. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Many thanks to Halipoo and its uh, chief tree hugging officer. Uh, and as you can see, uh, protecting nature doesn't always have to be like stern, stiff upper lip, dead serious work. It can also be playful, it can be fun, it can be crazy. And biodiversity can also offer business opportunities. This was just one, one great example. Now at this point, dear audience, we would like to ask you something. We would like you to answer a little uh, poll question that we have prepared for you. And uh, that poll question is on the webpage menti.com. So if you would be so kind and uh, at this point go to menti.com, uh, either Stride opening a new browser window or I think we can shortly get a QR code uh, on the screen as well uh, that you can you can uh, scan with your mobile device or you can go to that menti.com and use that code that you can see on the upper hand or uh, that eight digit code on the screen right now either use the QR code or just go to menti.com using using that code and there we have uh, a question for you so the question uh, reads as follows what kind of natural environment do you find the most revitalizing? And please answer using just one word at a time. I think there are like three different boxes, but uh, use one word at a time when you submit your answers. Uh, what kind of natural environment you find the most revitalizing? We've heard of many different environments by now, but we want to hear what, what do you think? What's the most revitalizing? And when you send your words, as you can see on the streaming window, your, your words will form a kind of a word cloud. It's going to be uh, bigger when we have more, more of your words there. And while you're typing your words and sending your ideas, let me ask Lisa, Lisa Kajala, Lisa, what would you say? What would be your word or words of choice? Well, uh, I find many kinds of nature very revitalizing, but I guess my favorite is long backpacking trips in the wilderness. So wild would, my, would be my first word. Wild would be. I, I think we have wild there as well. And if there, and the more we have that particular word, the bigger it will appear on the screen. Uh, wild. We let's let's take a look at that uh, that uh, word cloud that's forming there, Lisa. Forest seems to be a pretty popular choice. Yes, and many kinds of forests. There's rainforest. There's mangroves. There's. That's true. Uh, areas that include vast forest areas uh, all around the world. Here we see the wonderful global... <laughs> um, lots of uh, um, diverse participants from all around the world attending this session. That's great to hear. That's, that's wonderful. And uh, great words there. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. They are all great, great answers, great uh, words for, for depicting our revitalizing natural environments and it keeps on building and building. At this point I want to thank Lisa very much uh, for this and for the presentation as well and thank you for sending these words. We've got a few more polls like this or not like this that are slightly different but more polls coming your way later today but now let's move on and uh, let's continue our journey on the green continuum.
So as we can see, nature is good for not only our mental health and stress control, but it can also work miracles on our physical health. As a matter of fact, my own doctor a couple of weeks ago recommended that I should try walking in a forest since walking on such an uneven surface is great exercise and improves your balance. But anyway, those images of, of people hiking in a forest, they were wonderful. But what about uh, urban spaces, more urban settings? After all, most of our exercising takes place close to where we live. And I would assume that most of you, just like we, uh, will live in cities and towns. So now that we've talked about protected areas, our next stop is urban green spaces. And as we move to more urban areas, the biodiversity element decreases, but it's still there. So in these urban environments, green and blue spaces provide possibilities for nature encounters to urban dwellers while promoting well-being. And I'm sure it's obvious to all of, the, all of us how important nature and these natural elements and even glimpses of that are to us. It's, it's really important to take that into account in, in land use planning, for instance. Our next speaker focuses on nature-based solutions for health in urban settings. She will tell us about the benefits and impacts of such solutions and how they can be promoted in planning them. Our guest is an internationally renowned expert and scholar on health benefits of nature, outdoor recreation and nature-based tourism. She has explored these topics in hundreds of scientific publications and authored dozens of articles in peer-reviewed journals and books. She works as a research professor at Natural Resources Institute Finland, so it is my great pleasure to welcome research professor Ms. Lisa Turvainen. Uh, dear EUC and friends and colleagues, my name is Lisa Turvainen and I work as a research professor at Natural Resources Institute Finland in Helsinki. Um, I'm going to uh, tell you briefly about what do we know about health benefits of, of forests and what kind of uh, good practices we have found and we have to offer you from Finland. We know that nature is not only important for biodiversity, but also it's increasingly acknowledged as a resource for public health promotion. Uh, we understand with public health science that it aims at preventing disease, prolonging life and improving quality of life. In this context, nature has a considerable potential. Uh, many developed and developing countries today face large number of health and social channels challenges such as obesity, mental health problems, type 2 diabetes, and also social exclusion. Many such illnesses are found to link to chronic stress and other lifestyle factors such as inadequate physical activity. These problems unfortunately concern large number of people. They drive up healthcare costs and affect often more socio-economically disadvantaged groups. We have identified five key pathways delivering health benefits of nature that are seen in this figure in blue color. The first pathway shows that health benefits in nature are partly caused by reduced exposure to harmful air pollution and noise. Uh, the second channel links to mental health benefit improvement through stress reduction and mental restoration. And the third channel deals with the fact that nature is often found as an attractive environment for physical activity, both for adults and, and children. Also opportunities for strengthening social contacts or possibility to have our own time plays a role in health delivery. The fifth pathway suggests that concrete nature contact diversifies our microbial system that support, supports our resistance to some diseases, diseases such as allergies. Of course, the health benefits depend on what kind of areas we visit and, and how often. The most studied topic in this field are mental health benefits. Nature visits are found to increase positive emotions and decrease stress levels and negative emotions. Uh, 
Nature can also rapidly restore attention and cognitive performance, which are important capacities every day needed at our work or during our studies. These photographs uh, uh, present uh, examples of our large fields experiment in Helsinki, in our capital city. We found that restoration in large green areas was higher already after 50 minutes of, of, of visit, visiting the area compared to built environment. And more profound benefits can be achieved after longer visits. Physiological measures such as blood pressure and heart rate variability indicated similar effects uh, about uh, relaxation in green areas. For Finns, nature is the most popular environment to be physically active. Green exercise is found to have added value to exercise indoors uh, by providing not only improved physical condition, but, but also mental health benefits. Several studies also report that often large areas, often forested nature areas, attract people for green exercise. Here we see an example of a recent study in Helsinki. We asked uh, Helsinki residents in a survey how much they use green areas, which areas they visit the most, and what kind of qualities in nature they appreciate. The areas in the map with dark green colors show nature areas that are visited most often, at least once a week. The dark purple spots in the figure are places that Helsinki residents in indicated to have visited for physical exercise. The largest areas, often forested areas, uh, we see that received largest share of the visits. Next, we'll take a closer look at the largest na nature reserve in Helsinki and discuss some actions that the city has taken to meet the demand for nature uh, areas for recreation. Uh, the area is marked, uh, this Vanhan Kaupungin Lahti area is marked uh, in a purple color in the middle of this map. Uh, the area Vanhan Kaupungin Lahti uh, is designated as the nature reserve almost 60 years ago. This valuable bird wetland has been a notable outdooring destination already a long time. In Helsinki, uh, the demand for green area services is much larger than the current supply. And a uh, rather recently so-called Lab of Nature Trail was designed and constructed to improve inclusive access to area and to inform visitors about health benefits of nature. New trails allow allow visiting areas with limited ecological impacts on valuable on this valuable site. In addition to, uh, to trails, bird observation towers and uh, bird observation blind and information boards were constructed. Moreover, access to information was helped with a new no mobile application presenting services and main features of the 10 uh, top nature destinations in Helsinki. As mentioned earlier, contact with nature can diversify also human microbiota and support uh, human immune function. A recent experiment conducted in Helsinki with daycare children found that bringing forest soil and shrubs to playgrounds diversified children's microbiota already within three months. In these pictures, we see another example of how dead and decaying wood is brought to sites to enhance biodiversity in children's everyday play environment. Urban nature areas are often not secured due to urbanization and heavy land use pressures on existing uh, nature. Therefore, therefore, we need good arguments and actions to maintain or improve the supply of nature areas for people. We can also improve accessibility in terms of transportation, infrastructure and services, as well as access to information regarding the benefits and use possibilities of nature. 
We also need to understand better, better the social cultural demands and expectations of users. Some people may have little experience from nature and need more guidance and services uh, than on average. Also, uh, integrating health benefits with other ecosystem services is wise. For example, protecting old forests contributes to biodiversity, uh, maintain a carbon storage, and these forests are also very much appreciated and, and bring strong health benefits to people. Finally, I would like to say that nature is open for new ideas. This good example comes from city of Lahti this week, where spaces in urban forests and parks were offered for distant working for, for citizens. Uh, increased connectedness to nature is important, not only for well-being, but it's found also uh, to be linked to pro-environmental behavior. Pro-environmental behavior is needed more than ever before. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor Turvainen, thank you very much for a highly interesting presentation. And let me add that if any of our international guests plan on visiting Helsinki and Finland, that Vanha Kaupunginlahti Old Town Bay area that Professor Turvainen mentioned, it's definitely uh, worth visiting. Now let's take a look at another example of how nature moves us. And this example comes from Scotland. Uh, what kind of green health activities are there in urban Scotland? What are some of the main challenges and opportunities as far as green health is concerned? And what makes a good green health intervention? These are some of the big questions that our next guest will tackle. He's head of the People and Places team of Nature Scott, which is the national nature agency in Scotland. Furthermore, he has been a council member for the Euro Park Federation, the largest network of, of parks and protected areas in Europe. And he's had a key role in developing the famous Healthy Parks, Healthy People Europe program. So, ladies and gentlemen, joining us from Scotland, I'm very happy to give you Mr. Peter Rawcliffe. Good morning from Scotland. I'm Pete Rawcliffe from Nature Scott, Scotland's nature agency. I'm delighted to be able to join this finished session today and share experience about what we're doing in Scotland in this area. So why am I here? Well, we've been working with colleagues from Parks and Wildlife Finland for many years now, sharing national experiences and leading the development of healthy parks, healthy people approaches in Europe, including the development of a new and exciting programme from the Europark Federation of which I'm a chair, uh, currently chairing the Health and Protected Areas Commission. I've been asked to provide a brief insight today into what Scotland call, what we in Scotland call our natural health service. This is a long-term national programme uh, supported by Scotland's chief medical officer, which seeks to align and coordinate cross-sector working with health, with health colleagues to deliver a common goal of realising the potential of Scotland's outdoors as a health promoting asset. A key focus for this work is urban Scotland. This is where 80% of the Scottish population live and where there are some significant health issues associated with general Western lifestyles, but also significant concentrations of social and economic disadvantage. Like the rest of Europe, we're also struggling with rising mental health issues, particularly among the young and socially isolated. And we also have an aging population we need to keep more active for younger. There's great potential to do more. Despite first impressions, urban Scotland is more green than grey, with over 50% of our land in our towns and cities, cities classified as green or blue space, although not of all it, is, it is, is of good quality, attractive or safe. The importance of local green and blue spaces were further emphasised during COVID-19. Many more people used them, connecting to nature and reporting health benefits. However, a significant minority did not or could not access them, further widening health inequalities we see in Scotland. 
Investment in green infrastructure to create nature rich neighbourhoods, parks and green spaces is needed to address these challenges. Alongside this, though, we, we need to help more people to get active and connect with nature. This, slides, this slide provides a quick summary of a range of activities that we're operating across urban Scotland at present to do this. With those in blue most closely linked to targeted health activity, what we call pillars two and three of our natural health service approach. The columns in this table are not fixed, so some activities such as health walks can span more than one column. We have a wide range of organisation groups at national and local level which have a long tradition of doing this sort of work in urban Scotland. This includes public bodies, third sector organisations and community groups which span a range of sectors, environment, sport, leisure, education, health and transport. Many of face challenges over long term funding and sustainability, despite the benefits to public health they provide. Health promotion or health treatment programmes in local green space can be transformational in terms of improving health and well-being, but we also see benefits in terms of quality of life, social cohesion and improving places for both people and nature. At the core of good practice in Scotland are activities that adopt the five ways well to well well-being framework to better mental health. These activities are be active, take notice, connect with people in place, learn about nature and give some of your time back to care for it. In essence, this is at the heart of a healthy parks, healthy people approach. One example of it in Scotland is a wide ways well project in the new town of Cumbernauld. But there's a great diversity of approaches and how these activities are organised. Formal 12 week programmes with trained delivery agents developed by national bodies, either in the public sector or third sector, through to a plethora of one off small community groups which started with local volunteering and a good idea. This is a strength but it also means that the supply of these activities is not necessarily matched to demand for them from the health sector. To help bridge this gap, a key area of work for us has been the development of green health partnerships led by local health boards and local authorities. These help provide a more focused approach that links the area's natural assets to the delivery of local health and wellbeing priorities. GHPs are in place in four locations at present, including Dundee, Scotland's fourth largest city, and similar models are being discussed and developed for Edinburgh and Glasgow. We have pumped prime this work by supporting the core costs of a project officer and a work programme for each partnership. About 100,000 euros per year for each partnership in effect, which in terms of an area wide health intervention is very small scale. The evaluation from the first two years of the GHPs has shown that they are clearly adding value though. Results show that over 200 partners have been engaged and more than 350 green health activities have been promoted or established. There's an estimated 11,000 people in the health and environment sectors that have been connected across all four GHPs. And a total of 24 referral pathways are now being used to connect a broad range of target groups, including both physical and mental health conditions, to supportive green health projects and programmes. One of the areas that these partnerships have been working on is the development of green prescriptions to these types of activities as part of both formal and informal health pathways. Formal health pathways in, involve links to clinicians and primary care staff. Informal ones include third sector and self referral routes. This form of social prescribing is most advanced in Dundee, which has mapped the green health opportunities, identified 11 key delivery partners across the city and linked them to most of the GP practices. This is already achieving good results in terms of successful referral rates compared to other activities, with the next stage to assess the health benefits for the individuals taking part in these green prescriptions. That's been a very rapid run through of some of the exciting work that's happening in Scotland. Here are some links for some further information. Thank you for listening and I hope you'll be able to join us again for a session entitled Nature is Good Medicine, which is running, I think, tonight. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for sharing these uh, great examples and experiences from Scotland. And, and like you mentioned, like I mentioned earlier, for instance, that, that green prescription is a really great idea, something that all 
healthcare professionals should definitely have in their toolkit. So thank you very much. And Peter, if you don't mind, please uh, stay with us for just a couple of extra minutes because there's something I want to ask you. I want to ask everybody since earlier uh, I promised that we would have another poll question for you. And now is time for that poll question. The second question is ready on the same web page that you visited earlier. So if you have that earlier session still open you can just continue from there if you don't if you click that out uh, you can go again to that menti.com web page by using the qr code or just typing to your your web browser menti.com and entering that eight digit code uh, two three eight three seven eight three seven and then we'll have a question for you and uh, this is a slightly different question so it reads as follows what kind of natural environment moves you the most? And it's really up to you to decide how you interpret the word move. You can, you can think of it as, as moving literally, like physically moves you, or, or emotionally, like it touches you, it emotionally moves you. And, and note that you can choose only one option. And as you can see, the alternatives here are uh, areas rich in biodiversity, parks with good recreational services, national parks or nature areas close to home that sort of uh, uh, emphasizing, emphasizes the aspect of proximity and finally nature sites with easy access which underlines the, the aspect of accessibility. Uh, and when you have made up your mind, as several of you have already done, you can see those blue, blue balloons on the streaming window going to, the, to your choice. And uh, pretty much in real time, we'll see what kind of audience we have and how you weigh those options. But Peter, uh, while our audience is giving, giving their votes, what would, be, what would be your choice? I think that's a really hard question. I really appreciate where I live and seeing nature every day. But I also really value the, the trips into the great outdoors, into our more remote and rural areas too. So um, I think that in Scotland we, we, we have adopted this sort of progression model of place where actually it's the range of provision that we're trying to provide across these five, uh, these five touch points on the screen uh, I think is really important. So and when we when we look at the results exactly the one that was your choice by the way that nature areas close to home was that your choice it was yeah yeah okay so it was it's it's a clear winner here with uh, 43 43% uh what would you say about this uh, all allocation of balls <laughs> how does it make you feel I think it's good. I guess we have quite a specialist audience here, so I'm really, really pleased with that result. Um, we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate that. The, I guess for the general public, see value in in the everyday nature, uh, the birds and uh, species and trees, and wildlife that we might take for granted as, as specialist conservation bodies. Uh, the everyday sites of the commonplace are really important to people, and I guess one of the things that's happened in COVID is. Um, People have had more time to stop and look and appreciate what's on their doorsteps. And like Finland, we've had a, a tremendous growth in uh, people visiting the outdoors, both close to home, but also nationally. I guess I'll just leave you with a, a great comment from the head of um, our wildlife trusts in the UK, who we've, we've had problems with visitor, visitor management and issues and challenges around that. But uh, it's not too many people. It's not enough nature. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is uh, bring nature back into our towns and cities so that everyday experience is enriched and the health benefits we get from nature uh, are, are grown and strengthened. Well said. That's a great slogan, Peter. Thank you very much. We wish you all the best with your future projects and all these green health interventions. And many thanks to our wonderful audience as well for, for taking this poll and for all your votes. Okay, so far we have learned that nature uh, revives us and nature moves us and on top of that it also brings us together.
how nature and outdoor activities promote our social well-being and sense of community. I guess it's a no-brainer when we talk about protected areas and urban green spaces, but what about built environments, strictly built environment? Now let's focus on that as we continue our journey on this green continuum. Now, Nature-based solutions in built environment is a vast field, as you know. We have different solutions for different purposes. We have solutions for, for disaster resilience uh, in built environment, for instance. We have solutions for the circular economy and urban sustainability. And uh, regarding today's topic, we of course have solutions for promoting health and well-being, as we are about to see in a minute. Now let me ask you this. In what kind of built environment do we need health and well-being the most? Now this is not a trick question, there's no wrong answer here, but when you think of it, one of the most obvious answers, thinking about health and well-being, is a hospital, right? That's where we need health and well-being. However, bringing nature and biodiversity closer to us in a hospital is easier said than done. This following presentation will, will take us to the central hospital of Kainu in the city of Kajani in, in central Finland. It's a brand new hospital where the local social and welfare authority has joined forces with Parks and Wildlife Finland in order to create a unique state-of-the-art facility promoting uh, the benefits of healing and, and well-being. And our next guest will, will tell us more about this cooperation and also show us what it looks like in the central uh, hospital. When we asked the head of communication, Mr. Terho Pekkala, if he could give us a presentation in this workshop, the timing turned out to be a little challenging, but fortunately at the end of the day, Mr. Pekkala was able to uh, uh, record a video presentation for us. So let's have a look at how the central hospital of Kainu has brought nature closer to its patients and staff. I'm happy to give the virtual floor to the head of communications of Kainu uh, local social and welfare joint authority, Mr. Terho Pekkala. Hello, Sini. Uh, thanks for the invita invitation for the conference. I'm very sorry to inform that uh, I'm not able to do that, that on that day because I'm on, at the National Defense Service on the beginning of September. I have a proposition for you. I will make recorded video greetings for the conference and I will present uh, our cooperation uh, with your office and, and, and between our hospital. And here we are uh, in Kainu Central Hospital in the city of Kajani. Kajani is located uh, approximately 500 kilometers north of Helsinki. So my name is Terho Pekkala and I'm a head of communications in Kainu Social and Welfare Joint Authority. Uh, the previous 10 years I've been working here in, in the Central Hospital to, to build this our new hospital. One of the key targets of building this new hospital was to create a healing environment for the patients and a nice and viable workplace for professionals as well. We had an initial understanding of what it could be like. Keywords like wood, green and local were the main points to describe it. The architectural and building design was led by these principles. For instance, all outdoor walls are wood-constructed elements and wood has been used as much as possible in different settings. Hospitals are often quite repelling and clinical spaces, but we thought that it could be also a different kind of building. By the way, we have three saunas here as well. The cooperation with the Metsähallitus Parks and Wildlife began uh, 2019 with an initiative to have uh, local nature more present in the hospital. Bringing nature closer was a fundamental slogan that got several features with Metsähallitus services. The first was to present local nature locations with not so common ways, 
As a result, we got beautifully printed maps of Kainu nature. Some of those are marked with animal silhouettes, etc. These are reminders for patients and visitors that we have extraordinary and beautiful nature to enjoy and reserve in our everyday life. And of course, they give nice flavor to our hospital interior. The second was to utilize Parks and Wildlife's existing nature film materials. Here in Kainu New Hospital we have a cutting-edge smart technology for patients and staff. With every screen available you can watch and relax with nice stories of Finnish nature. The first baby was born about one hour after hospital opening in January 2020. This baby and every other newborn on that year got a special camping mug as a gift and a reminder to enjoy the forest environment. In addition, we have lots of nature-related art in and outside the hospital. It reflects the nature relation of our people. We also have a plan to get a nature path for urban park environment for the patients. That's real healing environment. Our partnership with Parks and Wildlife enables positive visibility for both organizations and gives concrete outcomes uh, instead of just talking about it. We are truly grateful for the uh, productive cooperation. Let's take good care of our nature. It's only borrowed for us humans. Thanks. Many thanks to Mr. Pekkala and, and to the Central Hospital of Kainu for these great examples and, and thank you for these great ideas of how to bring nature closer to us and closer to patients and staff in a hospital. In the beginning of this workshop, in her opening words, uh, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, Krista Mikkonen, pointed out uh, that children and youth play a key role in protecting biodiversity, in enhancing health and well-being and, and promoting nature-based solutions. She mentioned that, and I quote, involving children and youth is particularly important because evidence shows that nature connectedness can be constructed at and should be constructed at an early age. Now, as our journey on the Green Continuum is slowly drawing to its end, let's turn our focus more to children, because they are the future, right? Our next speaker reveals how we can enable play and learning in the woods. We'll learn how the city of Alahti mapped all the forests that kindergartens are using. And furthermore, how land use planning can advance and enable nature-based solutions, harnessing the expertise of, of local people. Our guest is a keen advocate of participatory planning and has done groundbreaking work in developing citizen engagement with great results. So I'm very pleased to welcome and give the floor to planning manager at the city of Espoo, Ms. Johanna Palomäki. Thank you, Sipekka. Good morning. Um, yes, so I currently work at the city of Espoo, but today I'm here to tell you about something we did. Uh, many years ago at the city of Lahti, where I previously used to work. This year, Lahti is the European green capital, by the way. Besides being an environmental city, Lahti is also a child-friendly city. And at the Technical Environmental Services, we planners wanted to advance these strategic goals. We knew about all the benefits being exposed to nature and the element brings, and that long-lasting behavioral habits are established in childhood, like Jussi just said. We also knew that kindergartens actively use the green areas all around the city. We read in the local paper of an unfortunate event. One day a group of children went to the woods and found that the trees had been cut down. It turned out the site was not in fact a park, but a planned site for residential development and the construction had begun. 
So we at the uh, Technical and Environmental Services asked ourselves how can we prevent these kind of accidents and how can we advance children's well-being by enabling exposure to nature. We decided to map all the urban green areas, parks and forests that kindergartens use in their daily activities. We wanted to know where these areas are, by which routes they are accessed and how often they are visited. We also wanted to map some of the affordances, the key natural features uh, that enable play and learning. So we designed a map questionnaire using Mapshanaire, a tool for creating place-based knowledge. And a project worker assisted kindergarten teachers in all 50 plus kindergartens in Lahti to respond to the questionnaire. In this way, we got a 100% response rate and were able to get a very re reliable data set. The respondents also gave their contact details for further reference. This is significant later on. Next, we had to ensure that the data we had gathered would not end up gathering dust. We distributed the data the same way all other planning data in the city is distributed. We marketed the results so that experts at the city would know of its existence. We also gave planning guidelines corresponding to the data set. Detailed planners find this information when taking up new planning tasks. As far as I'm aware, there have been no more tree felling accidents. Instead, there have been several small but significant uh, success stories. In one case, the detailed planner was able to ensure a public right of way through private residential land so that the children in a nearby kindergarten could have safe access to the forest they often visit. The forest manager of the city, Markus, uses the data set when planning forest maintenance operations. He looks up the kindergartens con concerned and calls them up because the contact details are in the data set. In one such phone call, there was some disagreement as to whether maintenance was necessary at all. So to appease uh, Heli, the kindergarten teacher, Markus asked he her uh, if there was anything, anything else he could help with. Heli told him, well, it would be really nice if we could have a child-sized picnic table in the woods. So Marcus and his crew built a child-sized picnic table and hauled it in the woods. Now and in the future, the children of Lahti are exploring nature, playing and learning in the woods. I'm pretty sure these small people will grow up to be happy and healthy big people. And that's why Lahti mapped all the urban green areas. Johanna, thank you very much for a really, really inspiring presentation. And here in Finland, we have parks and, and forests nearby. So I hope that all kindergartens are making the, making the most out of these, these possibilities and opportunities. So thank you. And, and please do join me for a minute since we have uh, one final poll question for our audience. And in, it's uh, on that familiar webpage, menti.com. Uh, and this time we'll, we'll give you a little bit different question with di a little bit different uh, alternatives for answering. Uh, most of you probably have that page, that session open already. If you don't, just you can see on the top of the screen the instructions, uh, menti.com and that code that you can, you can go to uh, insert and, and enter the page or using the QR code with your mobile device. And here we have uh, the question, it's slightly longer, I'll, I'll read it aloud. So what is the most important aspect to be developed so that nature could even better bring us together in built environment? So what should we do better? And here we have uh, alternatives uh, which are quality of recreational facilities, possibilities to participate in uh, guided tours to nature areas, land use planning, accessibility to nature sites, cross-sectoral partnerships and or, or some other aspect. And the way this works is that you have 100 points that you can allocate any way you like. So if you have one absolute favorite, you can give it uh, 
lots of points or even all of your points or you can divide your points uh, more evenly and and while you are thinking about this submitting your answers let's let's hear what what Johanna makes of these alternatives uh, or would you want to give your allocation first well actually I think uh Accessibility of nature sites and the quality of them are both land use planning questions. So I guess my answer would be land use planning. That's uh, true, that's true. And perhaps the most important feature is accessibility, but also in the sense that uh, it would be good to have access to different kinds of recreation sites or different kinds of urban green areas. Mm -hmm. But accessibility can also refer to like public transportation. Can For do, instance. can do. So you you could uh, indeed have good accessibility to some uh, national park, which is a bit further away, mm -hmm. and by public transport. But then you could have several different kinds of parks near you, where you could go by on foot or by bike. Exactly. And they would have different features. Some would be more more park-like and some would be more natural, for example. Mm -hmm. and what about this cross-sectoral partnership? Right now we have only like 15%. Does that mean on, or would it indicate that it's in a pretty good shape? There is work to do. I think the, the example that I told about in Lahti is a good example of mm -hmm. cross-sectoral partnership because sure we is. would not have been able to do that survey uh, without the help of the kindergartens. We got a 100% response rate to that survey because the kindergartens were dedicated to, to give the data and, and they understood why it was important for them to participate in the survey. Mm -hmm. So there was the, the education services and the land use planning and, and the environmental services uh, joined forces to, to, pr to produce that data and then to use it. Exactly. And uh, well, these pillars are changing as we get more and more results, but it looks like this accessibility that you mentioned is, seems to be a clear winner with, with over 30% of votes. And then we have that land use planning, which is kind of related to that. But what's a little bit surprising to me, or maybe I shouldn't be surprised, is that some other aspect is only 2%, uh, meaning that this is a good, uh, good selection of mm -hmm. things that we need to improve. But if we say a few words about the some other aspect, what, what do you think, what would, be, what would go to that category? Well, I was thinking uh, when I was reading these questions that uh, even in very built up environments, we have natural elements and natural features, say, street trees can be a True. very important factor Correct. in bringing nature into into the city. I've been a keen advocate of good street trees for years because having a good canopy over the street uh, can in, in itself already mm. you, uh, enable you to be a little bit in the nature in the city. I was thinking about for instance things like educating the decision makers, politicians, do they see very the, good what, idea. What, do you, what do you think do they s already see the value for exa for instance in the city of Espoo the value of biodiversity they do they do I, I think I think I think they do but uh, perhaps the ed education is not so much in seeing the value but but in how together we can advance uh, while the city of Espoo is growing very strongly, how we can work together to ensure that uh, while the city is being built up at a very fast pace, we don't destroy the natural values in the process. Good point. Joanna, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation and for this little chat. And uh, dear audience, thank you very much for your votes as well. It was really, really interesting. And uh, now, dear audience, we have almost completed our journey through the green continuum, starting from protected areas, moving through urban green spaces, and finally ending up in built environment and seeing all the different benefits and possibilities of biodiversity in all these different environments. Uh, I hope you've picked up some new ideas along the way. I hope you've enjoyed the ride and felt positive vibes because oftentimes when we talk about biodiversity and we hear for instance news stories about it we focus on risks and, and threats and gloomy future visions they are important but equally important 
or maybe even more important, I would argue, is to focus on the positive things, uh, the benefits, opportunities, possibilities, some of which we have seen today. Now it's time to start wrapping things up. To summarize what we have seen and heard and experienced today, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome the final speaker of this event. Uh, for concluding remarks, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Director of Parks and Wildlife Finland, Mr. Henrik Jansson. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I want to thank, thank everybody who has been speaking and taking part of the session and, 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 and making this session possible. And thank you also to all the participators and, and listeners out there uh, that has joined us in this uh, trip from, from protected areas to built environment. This has been really amazing. In this conference, there are many sessions on economics and biodiversity. It's a really important topic also, especially for decision making and politics and, and on, on a macro scale. But it's really important that we don't forget all these intangible uh, aspects also, also that the biodiversity can give to the people living uh, in, in the areas around them. And, uh, one of them is, of course, what we have been speaking a lot bit about in, in this session is the uh, healthy health benefits, the many health benefits that can be uh, obtained from, from visiting nature parks, nature areas uh, uh, or, or national parks or, 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 or nature already behind your back door when you go out in the, in the nearest park in the city. And I could say that the COVID-19 had actually shown that this, the, the importance of this and the importance of, of these values of health and, and health benefits, they're really global. And uh, there you, you, we have seen a huge trend of, of people going out in nature and see, seeking uh, relaxation, seeking benefits from it during the crisis we have been going through during the last year. And that also means that, that we, when we work with these teams, we should be working also globally without borders, as also we, we should be working with biodiversity without borders, because it hasn't, it, nature don't respect national borders. So in, in that sense, this session and these kind of sessions also hopeful in the future, they are, future, they are really important. We really need to be exchanging ideas and, and best practices, as we have been hearing today about best practices and, and really innovative ideas as the Halipu company in, in Lapland. Uh, very, I think we are really in the core idea of, of having a fun and playful idea, but that fun and playful idea really gives many people uh, benefits and, and well-being that they can take home with them after the after the uh, experience the work with health benefits and a nature solution nature-based solution should be done on all levels it should be done of course as i already mentioned globally it should be done on regional and national levels but it's really important that the concrete work on on, on the lower level on, on working with people one-to-one -one or, or making services possible, infrastructure possible in the, in the nature area. That's the, the real work that has to be going on and has to be developed. I think that one issue that was raised in, at least in the poll that we had at the last part, that we have to be very careful on and taking into consideration is the accessibility. In one of the videos, it was said that nature is for all. But for example, especially in the Western world and in Finland, many of the people that want to visit the nature, nature areas, they are getting older and we have a lot of people that need special assistance when visiting the areas and getting the health benefits. Therefore, working with accessibility on all, its, all the levels is also really important. Uh, I think it was Pete Rockcliffe who said, uh, and that we have a national health service in Scotland. I think that's a good, really good idea and really good uh, terminology to use. It's really about having health 
services and producing health services. And what is the best part of this is also connected to biodiversity and, and, and we can at the same time speak about biodiversity and, and make, it, make it possible to people to understand why biodiversity is so important as they get their benefits from it. Finally, as a concluding mark, I would say uh, what I heard in, heard in Lisa Turvainen's, uh, I think it was her concluding remark, it was, uh, I think it was really important, I, I'll have to find it here somewhere, that, uh, it was so good, so I have to read it. It's, what is it all about in, in this session that we have been talking about, this theme is to be in, innovative, to find new ways of, of giving benefits, health benefits to people, and make people fall in love with nature again. I think that's, that's the point that makes all this work uh, important. Thank you. Mr. Jansson, thank you for, for these closing remarks and thank you for beautifully summing up the key messages of this workshop. We have learned that nature revives us, that it moves us, and that nature brings us all together in a very unique way. We have learned that contact with nature brings great benefits for our social and for our physical and mental well-being. We've learned how important it is to preserve and take care of this green continuum in, in every environment, not just in protected areas, but in urban spaces and built environment as well. We need to have this holistic understanding of, all, of the benefits of nature and nature-based solutions. We have seen and heard a few great, great examples today, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's more to come. And like Lisa Kajala earlier mentioned, I also strongly encourage you to take part in, in a later session, a later workshop called Nature is Good Medicine. Uh, it complements this workshop and it explores nature-based solutions, focusing on opportunities for social and environmental uh, recovery in post-pandemic context. And this session begins at 8 p.m. Marseille time, so it's definitely worth checking out. In conclusion, I also would like to thank all our wonderful speakers and experts Thank you, our great online audience, for joining us, for interacting. Thank you for watching. Uh, do take care. And we want to leave you with, with these last video images from various Finnish national parks. With them, uh, remember to enjoy the nature. Thank you very much and uh, do take care. Bye-bye.
ta 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 ta